Hey folks, the Field and Garden Podcast is honored to be partnering with the Growing for Market magazine. They have been publishing practical ideas and information for direct market flower and vegetable growers for over 31 years. All the articles are written by farmers who get their hands dirty and know what they're doing. The magazine is still on the same mission as when the Flower Farmer book author Lynn Bozinski founded this magazine back in 1992 to connect growers with the best ideas from other growers. There is dedicated flower content in every magazine. A decade's worth of back issues and over 1,600 archived articles from writers like Aaron Benzenkang, Gretel Adams, Pamela and Frank Arnowski, and Jonathan and Megan Leese, all available on the website. With 10 new issues every year available on paper, digital, or both, you're guaranteed to find something to fine tune your farm and growing for market. So if you do farmer's markets, CSA, farm stands, pick your own florist sales, or wholesaling, whether you're a commercial grower or you just want to grow like one, subscribe to Growing for Market for the nitty gritty details of growing, marketing, and the business of local farming. And I have a special offer for you. Use the coupon code WORKSHOP to get 25% off any subscription to the original Farmer to Farmer magazine at growingformarket.com. folks, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm your friend and host, Lisa Mason Ziegler of the Gardener's Workshop, and hey, glad you're here for a great listen today. So friends, if you want to know more about us and the work that we're doing here at the Gardener's Workshop, you can check it out at thegardenersworkshop.com. All the links of everything we mention um, in this podcast will be down below in the show notes. And it is just a pleasure to share with you all the chat that I had with my friend, Lynn Bozinski. Um, Lynn is the author of the book that launched, um, I don't want to say the cut flower industry, The cut flower industry has grown so much in the past years, and Lynn has a big hand in escorting many of us into it, thousands of us. Um, And so her book just really was the shepherd that carried me along, and it was just a delight to have a conversation with her. And we kind of went down memory lane a little bit, and um, she's going to, she's sharing some current projects what keeps her busy these days, about starting um, the Growing for Market magazine, which is, um, to my knowledge, the only farmer-to-farmer magazine um, written by farmers for farmers that is going into its 32nd year, y'all, and growing more and more. Um, So Lynn's behind all of that, and I just admire her so very, very much. Um, And so let's take a listen so you can hear about what's keeping her busy these days. Hi, Lynn. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. Hi, Lisa. It's nice to be here. Oh, I mean, it is just so good to have an opportunity to talk to you. It's um, while Lynn and I have become friends over the past years, we haven't talked very recently. And it's just really, really good to kind of catch up and hear what you're doing. And um, so this is going to be a real treat for folks because I'm sure that you may or may not be aware. You are just, as far as I am concerned, as a season two decade plus flower farmer, your book, The Flower Farmer, is really responsible for leading the way for just thousands of people. And I just want to say this in case we get on a conversation. I just want to thank you so much for um, writing that book. Well, thank you. And I really feel so appreciative that you as a fellow author have continued to be really supportive of me and my book, because a lot of people just are competitive by nature, but you have always been so collaborative. And it has just meant the world for me, for me to 
see you promoting the flower farmer after all these years. So thank you. Lynn, thank you for saying that. And, you know, um, we could already go down a rabbit hole. You know, I am a firm believer in that um, we all work together to rise the tide, right? I mean, exactly. um, it's the competitiveness. Um, yeah, that's something that I don't even like to talk about because I just don't even try to put it in my vocabulary. So thank you so much for saying that. So I want to start off by us just talking a little bit. You know, the flower farmer first came out in 1997. Mm -hmm. And that was that was the original because I bought it that year. And then there was an expanded color version published in 2008. And I mean, the book, I mean, and that's why I still continue to promote it today. You give um, just information from so many different areas of flower farm. And it really gives a person like I was back then a snapshot of what this whole industry is about. So, you know, you mentioned in the book how, um, you know, there's just so many different avenues and I know the industry has changed so very, very much. Um, and it's helped me so much on my journey. If the book was going to be relaunched today, let's just say, um, you know, what might you consider a good addition or a change or is there none? Well, a lot of uh, growing information is just going to be the same, you know, throughout the centuries. It doesn't really change that much. But a lot of the marketing information has definitely changed quite a bit. And, um, of course, the cultivars I would update. There were, there's been an awful lot of plant breeding around cut flowers in the yeah. past decade. And I think that that is just a reflection of how successful the local flowers movement has been. When I was starting, you were kind of looking for something that would work as a cut flower. It maybe wasn't even promoted as a cut flower. But now, of course, there are just, you know, whole catalogs devoted to cut flowers and whole companies devoted to cut flower production. So I think that is a really big change. Um, I think that the profiles in that book were really inspirational to a lot of people because they showed that you don't have to be in California or in the Willamette Valley um, to be able to grow flowers successfully. They were profiles of people all over the country. And since the second edition was published, there's been people who have retired, but there's also been this huge influx of very successful growers. And boy, if I were doing it again, I would love to get out and visit them on their farms. And I know you do that because you do your um, online courses. And I know you have a lot of these really wonderful growers featured in those. So that would certainly be a change. Um, I think that social media didn't exist back then, and now it's pretty much the only way that you find customers because newspapers have gone away, magazines have almost gone away. Um, there's not radio talk shows like there used to be about gardening. You know, so much in the media landscape has changed in the past decade that that would be a big area to explore because some people do it really, really well and are very successful at it. And then I think finally, there's just this aspect of growing flowers 10 or 15 years ago, where as a local grower, you were trying to fit into this system that already existed, that entailed wholesalers and retailers. And, you know, you had to take what you were growing and fit it into that system. And since then, that has really changed a lot. And there's just a whole cultural demand for locally grown flowers now. And I think that is really reflected in weddings, the wedding business back when I was growing them. It was kind of a pain in the neck because people were still ordering wedding flowers like they did in the 1960s. You know, like if your <laughs> bridesmaids were wearing red dresses, you wanted all red flowers. And it may be a time of year when there aren't a whole lot of all red flowers grown locally. So it was just trying to fit that uh, fit into a system that really wasn't a good fit. But now people recognize the beauty and the extravagance of locally grown flowers. And so there's a demand for it that's really pretty much apart from the traditional floral system. You know, you I, one thing you just said that 
I just experienced it um, when you were talking about marketing and how, you know, back, you know, 20 years ago, newspaper and um, getting on radio shows, all those things, you were so right, because that's what literally um, just threw me into the limelight was, you know, I'm in the middle of the city, I was kind of a novelty. And my newspaper just grabbed me up to have something to write about. Well, it did come back this last year, but for the past five years, at least, our local newspaper didn't even have a gardening section anymore. So imagine my surprise just a couple of weeks ago when I uh, we still get the newspaper at our house. Um, Stevie opens the newspaper and lo and behold, there's like a home and garden section. He slides it over to me and here is a full page of a young lady holding a big bunch of obviously farmer flower grown flowers on the front of our newspaper. And she's right over in Norfolk. Her name is Dee, um, and I think in it's Mermaid. I will actually put it in the show notes um, because she is an up and coming flower farmer and is starting a co-op. But anyway, it brought back memories, Lynn, of back when I was first starting. And that's how I really got recognition, right? I mean, right. yeah. What we were doing was so unusual at the time that Reporters are always drawn to the unusual, especially if it's visually um, attractive yes. as well. And so it was a pretty easy sell to get a newspaper to come out and do a story about you. Now, you know, so many communities have lost their newspapers altogether or they've shrunk to, you know, a tenth of the size that they used to be. Yeah. That you would be very lucky to get a paragraph. And for any newspapers out there listening, I will say that since that, I guess it was actually two weeks ago that that happened um, this past weekend, because I don't normally have time on a weekday to read newspaper. But let, this past weekend, I grabbed the newspaper up just to have a look to see what you know what I mean. There is demographics to support that kind of information. But back on our subject. So marketing is a whole different animal now than it used to be um, for all aspects, the way you market them. And then the marketing um, areas that are available. I think that you're talking about weddings. I mean, has that not actually, I was just speaking to um, Jenny Love on interviewing her for a podcast and she was sharing that she was, I mean, she didn't share, it kind of came out that she was one of the pioneer farmer florist, you know, 10 right. years ago or however long before that. I mean, what did people do before then? I guess they just ordered all their flowers from a florist, right? Exactly. Or even from the supermarket florist. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. You know that you say in that, you know what that reminded me of? Do you um, remember? I can't remember if it was, I guess it was probably in Growing for Market. You wrote about your experience of where you had kind of downsized your growing and the local florist shop that I think was in a supermarket asked you to like take over for several months for somebody or something. Did, is that kind of even close to what you actually did in my memory? Mm, I don't remember that. So no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, well, no, that's all right. Maybe. So what you ended up, the moral to what I read or saw was you learned about what shrinkage was oh, and right. how significant shrinkage is for those of us that are flower farmers that are selling to florists because, you know, people rumble about, you know, yeah. I know how much they paid for that stem and now they're charging this much. Well, that's just not the equation that prices right. are based on. Right. Exactly. And there's this thing called shrinkage. So tell us what shrinkage is. So shrinkage is just the waste, the flowers that don't get sold. And it's really important to understand shrinkage both from the perspective that you mentioned of understanding how florists set their prices, because they have a huge amount of wasted product. Yeah. And then also from your own perspective, if you're the one making the bouquets and you might think you've put $15 worth of stems into this bouquet, stems and labor, um, but what about shrinkage? What if all those bouquets don't sell at the farmer's market? Yeah. Have you accounted for that loss and have you priced up accordingly? So it's definitely something that you need to think about. That's a great point, Lynn, that it's not just the flowers that you sell. What happens to all the flowers that you spent time, money, perhaps labor um, on growing that don't ever get sold? And that's kind of 
um, you know, that's a big picture. That's a big discussion, isn't it? But yeah, that's some really great food for thought. So I'd like maybe for us just to shift gears a little bit. And I'd like to hear a little bit about how Growing for Market um, came to be, which is just another, um, I considered it my lifeline back during the pre, I mean, when I say to growers, we hardly had internet when I started growing. I know. I mean, does that age me or what, right? But I can remember the world stopped when my magazine, Growing for Market, arrived in the mail. And I mean, you just devoured it. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about this wonderful resource, how, how you founded it and made it, grew it into what it is, because it's continuing on with someone else today, right? Yes, if you had told me uh, 31 years ago that Growing for Market would still be being published from a small farm in Maine, I would have laughed. But <laughs> in 1991, um, I was teaching at the University of Kansas and I was um, market farming on the side with my husband. And we were kind of in the tail end of that back to the land movement from the the 70s and early 80s. And there was a lot of activity on the coast, but in the rest of the country, there was not so much of this um, organic market farming direct to the consumer type of activity. And we just felt like we were having to invent everything ourselves. We had to start our own chapter of an organic certification agency, for example. Wow. Um, we didn't have any labeling. We had to sew our own banners that said organic produce at the farmer's market. And so I, having come from a journalism background, I was a newspaper reporter for 10 years and then I was teaching. Um, I decided to start my own magazine, but I really didn't expect it to have the longevity or really the warm reception that it got. I was a little nervous about it because I was in Kansas in the middle of the country and certainly not where all the trends were being set. And um, I, it was just so rewarding. A couple of seed companies loaned me their mailing lists for that first issue. And we sent out a few thousand free copies to farmers and people everywhere. I just were thrilled. And over the years, I realized it's because so many of us were really working in isolation. We didn't really have the camaraderie that you have now on social media. Yep. There was no social media. There was no internet in 1992 to speak of. And, you know, we, we didn't have these growers groups. We didn't have the annual conferences. You were just on your own out there trying to do this incredibly powerful but exhausting thing of growing food for people. And so that was where I took it upon myself to start this magazine. And it originally I was, I mean, it was a real threadbare operation. We didn't have much money to get started because we were mostly market farming ourselves, but it kind of took over and, and uh, took off and paid for itself pretty quickly. And over the years, we got more and more people who wanted to contribute articles to it. And that's where it really started to take off. When it became a voice for farmers who wanted to write, that's when it really got secure and became, like you say, something that people looked forward to reading. And we've had, you know, over the years, we had so many incredible writers, people who are now you know, pretty big celebrities like Erin Benzikin. The first place she wrote was for Growing for Market. And of course, now she has the Florette Empire. And um, Pamela and Frank Arnosky had a regular column about cut flowers for many, many years there. Uh, Steve and Gretel Adams, I think that was the first place they wrote. So there were all these farmers on the flower side and then on the vegetable side. I mean, we had articles by Elliot Coleman and Richard Wiswall and, you know, people who really became the celebrities of the small farm movement. And so I ran it for 25 years. And <clears throat> during that period of time, I um, kind of switched, we sort of switched away from vegetables and more towards flowers. In fact, it was the flowers that were so successful. And that's what caused me to write The Flower Farmer, because I really felt that it would benefit vegetable farmers to be able to have this crop that was pretty profitable and really not as much work as picking yeah. watermelons and stuff like that. <laughs> For real. <laughs> yeah. And so um, 
when I decided to retire from farming, I had so many different things going on, so many balls in the air that I kind of had this 10 year plan toward retirement. And one of the first things that I decided to do was to sell growing for market. And so I just looked at all the people who were the regular contributors and I had a list of my top three people. The first one was Andrew Mefford. I called him up on New Year's Eve and I said, Andrew, I'm thinking about selling growing for market. Would you have any interest? And he said, yes. I mean, he didn't even have to think about it. He just said, yes. And about two weeks later, he flew out from Maine and we sat down and we hammered out a deal. And he took it over in uh, March of 2016 and has been doing a great job ever since then. I couldn't be more pleased with the job that Andrew is doing. There's just so much good information in there. You know, um, I just interviewed Andrew last week. Oh, did you? And so I'm really familiar with Uh him. I'm I'm really kind of, um, I love Sharon, and you're another one, of people that started out farming. And there's so many paths that can lead from being a farmer. And it's kind of like, how'd you get here? You know, kind Mm -hmm. of question. And he shared with me all of that, how he went, just like you, went to college for journalism and um, then kind of got away from that. And in the end, it has come out to be um, such a great deal. So, you know, I want to say that back when it was just um, paper copy before all the internet really Mm -hmm. happened, you know, and it's still true today, um, you know, you had always had such great flower columns, but because there was so little information for small market farmers, I found that all the articles really, I could take nuggets. I mean, the people that were growing the cool season vegetables really helped plant the seeds for cool flowers. You know, I learned from techniques and ideas and how things worked. And um, so, I mean, you really were so forward thinking, connecting farmers to farmers. Because I find that's what's really significant about that magazine. Right. And I think that, you know, all the other farm magazines have kind of fizzled. You know, they were fizzling early on because farming was really going out of style at the same time that market gardening was coming in. And I remember when um, Rodale shut down the new farm magazine because they only had 45,000 subscribers. And I was like, God, you know what? I wouldn't give for 45,000. I'd kill for (laughs) 45,000. (laughs) <laughs> You'd kill yourself is what you would do. Yeah. <laughs> <be exhausting>. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, things have really changed in that regard too. And it's just great to see Growing for Market continue as a print magazine. Yes. Because people love print. They still love it. Yeah. You know, you're so very, very true. You know, I didn't print a catalog this year just mm-hmm. for a multitude of first time in 12, 13 years. Um, We did a digital version of it, which we made a big investment in. um, And we are already hearing that, you know, people love paper. And I mean, it's just, I'm a paper person. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I, um, the magazine is as significant to me today as it was. I mean, it was my lifeline back then. Um, But anyway, so I just think that you were your model of having farmers um, write the art, share what they were doing on their farms. And it also connected us, right? I mean, I did feel like, I mean, I am a friend of Pamela and Frank Arnowski today, but back then I felt like it, even though they didn't know who I was, I was a BB in the Astrodome, right? (laughs) Um, But I just think that it's a great general magazine and that is just another gift that you've given us. And Andrew is doing an excellent job of, um, you know, shepherding that into what it's coming, what its future is, I guess you would say, where it's moving to. Um, So, you know, I know that um, you're still probably gardening a little bit. I don't think you're farming. Share with us, what is, um, what are you doing these days? What's keeping you busy? What are your passions or projects or what's in the hopper? Well, other than the two grandchildren, (laughs) which keep me excited and happy, um, I had so many projects that were kind of always percolating in the back of my mind when I was doing these other jobs. And uh, I finally had the freedom to pursue some of those. So the main thing 
you know, as I said earlier, we started off as vegetable farmers and I feel like I've kind of come full circle on that. I still remain really, really interested in helping people to grow their own food. And in 2010, we had the opportunity to buy a small seed company called Seeds from Italy. And it's the U.S. distributor for Franchi Cementi, which is Italy's oldest family-owned seed company. It was founded in 1783 and is wow. still run by the same family. Um, Jean Piero Franchi is the CEO now. And that has been such a really interesting and wonderful path that we went down. Um, the company itself is fantastic. Mr. Franke, we always call him Mr. Franke. He, he thinks of it as an international family, he says. And every second year, he holds these trips for all of his distributors around the world and takes us on an all expense paid vacation for a week where we just go see the sites. And wow. like we went to the Amalfi coast one year and then another year we had a, a week on the south coast of Spain. And we've met people all over the world who do the same kind of work that we do. And that's been a really wonderful thing because, you know, after all these years of meeting people all over the country who are in the same line of work to now have friends all over Europe, it's just fantastic. Um, so that's been a really enriching thing. And of course, as you know, from running your own seed company, it's a lot of hard work and not necessarily real exciting work, but <laughs> the mission at the base of it is really important. And it's not so different from farming in that regard. You know, washing beets is not that exciting, <laughs> but knowing that you are feeding your community is what keeps you going. And it's kind of the same thing with seeds, you know, growing and selling seeds is incredibly important work. And where would we be without seeds? We'd all die off in a couple of years. It's so true. It's a really important business to be in. And so that's been real fun. And having been a vegetable farmer and gardener my entire life, I feel like I have an awful lot of knowledge and I'm just I'm constantly trying to put it down on paper for future generations. And so I've done, I appointed myself the director of horticulture at Seeds from Italy and stopped doing so much of the marketing and the administrative work and just started doing the growing. So I have a pretty good sized trial garden and trying to eventually grow out all 500 varieties that we sell. And um, I do the blog for Seeds from Italy and do a lot of the catalog material. So just the educational aspects of things. But I have a couple of personal projects too that are a little bit different. One of them I think is gonna to go to the printer in the next couple of weeks. I've been working on, well, first of all, let me back up and say that having been a gardener for many, 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 many years, I have always kept gardening records, gardening journals. And I realized when I was um, trying to plan last year's garden that I had like an eight foot inch stack of these gardening <laughs> journals. And I'm like, I'm never going to be able to find anything in these journals. You know, if you want to find out well, what was that one cucumber that I grew that I liked so much and made so many pickles from. And I go back and I'm just flipping and flipping and flipping and I can't find it. And I finally thought, okay, I need to get organized. So I created for my own use a gardening journal that is organized by variety. And I had it printed at Blurb or someplace like that. Um, and I used it for a year and I really liked it. And I thought, oh, this is like a revelation <laughs> for garden planning. So yeah. I, I turned it into a product that I'm going to publish as a, a garden planner and notebook. And so it's got all that information that you have to look up every year because you've forgotten, oh, how many weeks before frost free do I start my tomato seeds or my asparagus seeds or whatever. So it's got all that information, vegetable by vegetable by vegetable. And I'm hoping that it will keep me organized, but also help a lot of other people be able to learn from their experience to both know the, you know, how to replicate their successes and look back and see why something failed and try it a different way. So that's the big project that's coming to fruition right now. The other thing is that I've been working for some time, sort of in the background, on a book about um, the history of our favorite garden plants. And that involves a lot of plant breeding. 
And there's not a whole lot written for the layperson about plant breeding I've discovered. And so I've been kind of poking around at the edges of that topic for a, a little while. And then during the early months of the pandemic, I had this <clears throat> little zinnia garden outside my back door. And I always grow the Franke plants, of course, since I have free seeds. And they're all open pollinated. They're no, no, nothing, supposedly right. nothing special about them. But when you have open pollinated plants, you get all kinds of interesting stuff. And so one day I walked out there and I saw this zinnia. Now, you know, as a cut flower grower all these years, how many zinnias have you risen? Have you raised maybe a million zinnias? At least. <laughs> Two million? I don't know. I, I raised a lot of zinnias. And um, I saw this zinnia that was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And I thought, huh, well, there's a reason that's here. And it either has to do with the pandemic giving me something to keep me busy, or it has to do with this book about plant breeding. So I decided that I would take that on as a project and try to save these seeds and try to um, replicate them next year. And so I'm about, I'm, this will be my third year into this project. And I've gotten some really, really interesting results. And, and I don't know what I'm doing, but as with everything in growing plants, you just grow it and you see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> that is really exciting, Lynn. I mean, the planner sounds really interesting. You have to keep us posted on that. And I'm really interested. You're so right about the breeding thing, because there are, we, of course, are just bombarded with questions through social media and through our inbox. And there's a lot of people, they don't want to be, um, do a deep dive on plant breeding. Right. They just want to know how does that work? You know, what are the different requirements? And so that is really, really exciting. Um, yeah. So you're planting more zinnias this year to see what your seed saving brought from last year. That's exactly. Great. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out how to keep them all isolated. I have three different places where I can garden now. And so I'm trying to organize everything. I've got 13 different possible combinations that I did from last year. So we'll see. Record keeping is very important. <laughs> Well, and that is your strong suit. That is not my strong suit. So that is just so wonderful that you are um, hitting, hitting onto that. Yeah, if you any know, plant readers out there hear this and they want to help me, please reach out. <laughs> um, that may just come true. Um, so Lynn, it's just been such a pleasure to catch up with you today and for, for us to have a look at the flower farmer, you know, 20 years is it 20 years? It's 30 years, Lynn. Wow. 30. No, not quite. 25. 25. Yeah. 1997. Yes. No, I'm sorry. I was thinking of growing for years. market today. Yeah. yeah. It's been 30 something for growing for market. I mean, what a pleasure just to walk down memory lane with you and to catch up and to see what you're, um, what you're up to. So is um, Seeds from Italy, are they active on social media? Can people kind of follow along with them and check, catch up on your blog over there on vegetable growing, right? And flowers, I would yeah, guess. Yeah, that's correct. We've, we've passed the business along to our adult children. Our son, Will, is Will Nagengast has taken over as the director of it. And his wife, Amanda Nagengast, does all of our social media. So yes, you can find Seeds from Italy on Instagram and Facebook. Um, our daughter, Laurel Nagengast, also works there. And we're just kind of doing the fun parts of that business now. So yes, people can definitely catch up with us on social media if that's their preference, but also we do have a paper catalog and we um, have a really extensive website that we're always trying to develop with new photographs, you know, from the trial gardens and just really keep things as informative as we can make them. That is so awesome. That is so great because it's really all about information. I mean, right. it's just having the right steps to follow to get the end result that we're really after. Yep. So Lynn, it's just been a pleasure. And um, I thank you for taking the time to bring us all up to date on, you know, what you're doing. And we just love hearing from you. You're just um, such a significant part of our industry. And we thank you so much for that. Well, thank you, Lisa. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk about these things for me too. I just, 
feel so lucky that I had this beautiful life growing cut flowers and I just really want to do anything I can to support the next generation of people who come along to do that. So thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Till we meet again, friends. All right. Ciao. Next year. <laughs> Bye. So friends, isn't it just good to hear her voice and her perspective on things. I just really appreciate Lynn and all she's brought to our industry and still is. Um, And I will have all the links for everything that we mentioned in here. Um, Their seed company, um, business seeds from Italy um, that also um, sells her book, the Flower Farmer book, um, as well as vegetable seeds and Friends, we'll just keep you posted on anything that comes out from Lynn that we all need to know about. You can count on us sharing it with you. And um, so if you want to review or share this podcast, we really, really appreciate it. It helps us so much because, you know, reviews, when you review our podcast on whatever app you listen on, that makes that podcast app show our podcast to more browsers. When people are just looking for something they'd like to, you know, listen to. So you just don't know how much it means to me. I read every review and I can't thank you all enough. And until we meet again, friends, ciao.